cleanse my guilt and pride. Blood of Christ the Unleavened Bread Ministries presents from your hands your feet Unleavened will Bread Bible Studies with Jesus David Eels. What can quench my thirsting soul? Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow. Greetings, saints. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. Let's uh, go to the Lord and ask His grace so we can study some Word. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you so much for opening our eyes to your Word, Lord. Lord, your Word is precious to us. It's important. We want to know what it is to partake of the unleavened bread, Lord. And our hope is in you, Lord. Our faith is in you that you will both put in our hearts a desire to seek you out in your word and a desire to repent as we read your word and have the renewed mind of Jesus Christ through your word. Thank you, Father. Thank you for drawing us to you. Thank you for enabling us to walk in your presence. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, um, help us to be encouraged today for our lost loved ones. Lord, many people are looking at the horizon and, and seeing the troubles that are coming upon the world, and um, they worry, you know, that their lost loved ones are, don't seem to be moving in the right direction and uh, don't seem to be listening to what they're being told. And uh, Lord, I just ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, to put faith in them today, Lord. Faith to hold fast the confession of their hope that it waver not. Faith to believe in your salvation, Lord. And um, thank you so much for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, is that you? Are you worried because you've been telling your loved ones um, about the things that are coming upon the world and they're not really listening and, uh, and you're uh, nervous because we seem to be running out of time here. <clears throat> well, one thing you should remember is the Lord always starts on time to finish on time and we're supposed to be believing Him for them. We really can't do anything. We can't talk anybody into anything. We can't cause people to walk in the steps of Jesus. We can't draw them. Um, you know, no one comes unto the Son except the Father draws them. This is God's work. We have to go to God by faith for them. Just talking to them, trying to convince them, all these things, it's useless unless God is doing His thing. And uh, He uses our faith to do that. You know, He wants us to, um, to believe Him for our loved ones, people around us that we uh, are trying to share the Word with. I want to share just a little something with you here about household salvation uh, because I feel for my own struggles, you know, that um, it's very easy to get back into the flesh concerning your loved ones, you know, because you see what they're doing, you see what the book says, you know what God's doing in your heart, and you don't, it doesn't look like they're getting ready. Well, just remember this, that when Israel went into the wilderness, God um, raised up many children in that wilderness. And uh, children who went into the promised land, some of the grown-ups did not go into the promised land. Some of the parents didn't go into the promised land, but uh, many children did. So just remember, these were not children who were born of God when they went into that wilderness. And it's the same with Jesus. You know, Jesus... Um, came and, and preached in the, the first three and a half years of the man-child ministry. And, uh, of course, he had a first fruits that came and listened and uh, were drawn of God and were, you know, the forefathers of uh, Christianity and so on and so forth. But also, all during that three and a half years, people were coming to Jesus. And, again, in the book of Acts, there were people coming to Jesus. So don't get shaken out of your 
faith because of what you're seeing. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. And uh, let me just say a few words, you know, to encourage some of you about this household salvation thing because some people don't know if they can really trust God with their relatives, you know. Um, Exodus chapter 12, you know, is um, actually the sign of salvation to them when they were about to enter into the wilderness. And uh, in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3, the Lord says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take unto them every man a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Now, <clears throat> the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ, who, uh, who died for us, and whom we, by, by the way, have to eat to have our Passover. 1 Corinthians 5 tells us that Jesus Christ um, was our Passover. That sacrificial lamb was, according to this, for a household. That's not an accident that God wrote that in there. Um, that each lamb was for a household. Meaning God wants to save you, but he wants to do exceedingly above all you can ask or think in bringing your family into the kingdom. He wants the kingdom to be a wonderful place for you. And he wants your, your family to be there with you. And he's made opportunity for that through faith, um, the sacrifice of his son, that every household would eat this lamb. And this seems to be borne out in the New Testament in case people don't follow my type and shadow here. It seems to be borne out in the New Testament that, that God will do this. And uh, I'd like to go to Acts chapter 16 and read just a little bit to you. Uh, we'll start in verse 22. As you know, Paul and Silas uh, were beaten for preaching the gospel and were thrown into prison. And verse 22 says, And <clears throat> the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent their garments off them and commanded to beat them with rods. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, cast them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. So they had them well shackled down, right? But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns unto God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Isn't that amazing? Do you think God's into breaking all the prisoners out of prisons on this earth? Do you think it would be uh, anarchy if he did that? I suspect so. So what was he doing here? Why would he have done that here? Is it because he wants to show us something deeper here? Obviously, God doesn't want all the lawbreakers loose. I mean, he made laws, you know. He's a God of laws, you know. So he doesn't want all the lawbreakers loose to go out and do their own thing. They've done it once, and that's why they're locked up, right? Well, <clears throat> I think that there's a type and a shadow here. You know, we are all prisoners uh, to the old man. And as you know, Isaiah 61 is a prophecy concerning Jesus. He quoted it in Luke uh, about himself, that he, was, uh, he came to set the captives free and open the prison to them that are bound. And you'll notice in this text that, hey, everybody that was close to Paul and Silas, um, they were prisoners. They were prisoners who were released by this uh, sudden earthquake. What's really strange is earthquakes, you can imagine earthquakes possibly shaking the doors loose, but taking the shackles off of the people, that's pretty amazing there. I mean, that's, that's a supernatural work of God there. Naturally, earthquakes can do some things to free prisoners, but taking their uh, shackles off and their bands off, nah, I don't think so. That's a little much. But notice, you know, everybody, everybody was freed. 
Um, everybody was freed that was in prison with Paul and Silas, that were close to them, that were in prison with them. They were free. And, um, you know, I think we, we might even have another very similar instance in Acts chapter 27. Let me read that to you. And in this case, um, uh, Paul was um, on a very dangerous voyage in which the um, ship was driven before a storm. And um, then Paul says this, he says, in verse 20, And when neither sun nor stars shone upon us for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was now taken away. So just look at this type here. I mean, just like Paul was in prison, and the people around him were in prison, and they were set free, now we got Paul in a boat. <clears throat> and uh, hope for their salvation was lost. Verse 21, And when they had been long without food, and then Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not set sail from Crete, and have gotten this injury and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am, and whose also I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must stand before Caesar. And lo, God hath granted thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it hath been spoken unto me. But we must be cast upon a certain island. The Lord granted Paul everybody who sailed with him, and he said, I believe God. It's going to be, it's going to be because I believe God. Well, there's another really strange instance. Why did God save all these pagans that were sailing with Paul and all these pagans over here that were in jail with Paul. I don't think it's an accident. I think it's God showing us that even if God would save all those lost people for that purpose, what would he do for us? If he would do this for him, what would he do for us? And how about all the people that are in the boat with you and me? You know, what about all the people that are coming out of the prison like you and I, you know? Well, what will God do for them? Well, the key here is I believe God. You should have listened to me to been saved, but, but, and, and it wouldn't have, you wouldn't have gone through all this trouble, but I believe God. You know, God has granted me everybody that's in the ship with me. Okay. And back over to Acts 16, the story doesn't stop there. Let me read on because there's more significant words spoken here. Um, <clears throat> so everybody was loosed. Their bands were loosed. Their shackles were loosed. Quite an earthquake there now. Uh, verse 27. And the jailer, being roused out of sleep, seeing the prison doors open, drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Well, you know, it's a pretty bad offense. I mean, you, you must think that he did a really good job of shackling these people in there to make sure they didn't get away if he thought it was going to cost him his life if they did. He would have done a very good job, right? Verse 28. <clears throat> but Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for lights and sprang in, and trembling for fear, fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, <clears throat> and here's the same key again, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. There it is again. Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. Some people would say, well, that was just this one instance, you know. But so far we've seen several instances of this, and we see that, um, that the, the Lord is our Lamb, and he was the lamb for a household. So we, 
we see that um, the key here is believe on the Lord Jesus. And not only you will be saved, but your house will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Some people say, well, David, what about election? You know, what about predestination? What about these things? Well, God has methods by which he elects or predestines. If you say God doesn't do that, you probably haven't read the Bible yet because it's very plain God does do that. Now, <clears throat> we don't want to get into that today, but I'd like to point out to you that God has a method for getting there, for bringing things to pass, and he uses our faith. You know, didn't Jesus say, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them and you shall have them. He uses your faith for everything that you pray for. He uses your faith. And faith is the substance of the thing hoped for. Do you believe that God is going to save your relatives? Do you believe it? If you do, God can use your faith to bring it to pass. Um, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Thou, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. So that was part of the believe on the Lord Jesus, right? And they spake the word of the Lord unto him with all that were in his house. And he, and he uh, by the way, how is it that God can promise you people like that? Well, because salvation is from God. It's not from you. You didn't choose him. He chose you. And when he chooses someone... And he puts that drawing in them to come to God. Jesus said, all that the Father giveth me shall come unto me. God has the ability to wake people up, to um, give them faith, which is a gift from God, to grant them repentance, which is another gift from God that Scripture declares. You, it's not an accident that you came to God. God planned it from the foundation of the world. And so he can give this gift to anybody. I mean, if he could give it to Paul, who was killing the saints, who, if he could wake him up right in, in mid-step, he could certainly do it for you and anybody else, right? So this is God's gift. He can do with, with it what he wants. And if he chooses anybody, they will come to him. I didn't say they would all stay, but they will come to him, okay? Verse 33 says, And he took them that same hour of the night, and he washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, immediately. And he brought them up. So there was a fulfillment. Obviously, they all got baptized. They all believed, and they all got baptized. It was the fulfillment of God's promise, you know. And uh, he brought them up unto his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly with all of his house, having believed in God. All of his house believed. Now, sadly, it doesn't always happen that way. But um, the promise is the same. Uh, sometimes we have to endure a trial of our faith. Sometimes we have to watch our, our, um, our children, our spouse, our grandparents, our parents, or somebody, you know, of our household, somebody that, that is obviously going their own way, doing their own thing. But how many of you know that if you hold on to the faith, you begin to see God do wondrous things in their life? And, and also that if you watch their lifestyle and their failures while they're still walking in bondage to the old man and uh, in bondage in Egypt, um, they can really cast your heart down. You have to get your eyes on the promises and off of the problems, right? And uh, we have examples also, not a little further back in this uh, chapter. Let me see, verse. Uh, let's read verse 13 in chapter 16 here. And on the Sabbath day, we went forth without the gate by a, a, a riverside where we suppose there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spake unto the women that were come together. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, one that worshipeth God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened to give heed unto the things which were spoken by Paul. Now, if God doesn't open your heart, or if he doesn't open the heart of a relative or a loved one or someone that you're praying for, there isn't a thing you can do about it. Not a thing. I mean, this has got to be a gift of God. By grace have you been saved through faith, and that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. And none of your works is going to bring someone into the kingdom either. It has to be a gift from God. So we have to, just trying to convince someone, you can actually do more harm than good in some cases. You just have to go to God by faith that he will draw this person so that you can see and feel the door opening so that you can share with them, okay? So this is what happened to Lydia and her household, you know, whose heart the Lord opened to give heed unto the things which were spoken by Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, here it is again, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So she and her household, it mentions it again, her household uh, came into the kingdom by the grace of God. Isn't that neat? And um, chapter 18 there's a story here I'd like to read to you. Let's start in verse 5. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was constrained by the word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they supposed themselves, when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook out his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and went into the house of a certain man named Titus Justus, one that worshipped God and whose house joined hard uh, to the synagogue. And verse 8, And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Do you think, why does it mention this so often in here? You know, he believed with all of his house. I believe because, because God has given us favor. Because, because we believe in the Lord, God gives us favor with our household. Matter of fact, it, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, let me read that to you. Something that I'm sure a lot of people do not understand. Um, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 7 and 14, it says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in the brother. Well, how can this be, you know, sanctified? Because sanctified means separated. And, um, you know, we were sanctified from the foundation of the world, but we're manifestly sanctified when God sets us apart from sin unto God. Well, uh, sanctification being set apart, why would God set a wife or husband apart because of their spouse being a Christian? Well, because obviously God is saying that he has separated this person unto him because uh, they are a Christian. And because he wants to please them and wants to, through their faith, save their loved one. Okay, let, let me read on, though. He says, Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy, which is also the same basic root word for sanctification, holiness. But now are they holy. Um, now, here's the part that causes some people to object. They say, Well, yet, if the unbelieving departeth, let him depart. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us in peace. And, and here's the problem. He says, For how knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? And how knowest thou, O husband, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Well, notice, if he said, If the unbelieving depart, let them depart. You're not bound in such a case. In other words, you're not bound in that marriage to this person because they're unbelieving. Uh, in other words, how do you know that while in the marriage, as a husband and as a wife, this person will be saved? You don't necessarily know that. You know, if you're believing for them to be saved, believe for them to be saved. Do you, how many people, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, how many people, uh, a husband or wife left the marriage and uh, remarried and got saved after they got remarried? Have you ever seen that happen? Many times that happens. Many times. You know why? Because that husband and that wife 
have prayed for the salvation of that person. They didn't get saved as a husband or wife of this person, but they got saved. How many times do you know that this happened? Many times this happens. Uh, too many to be a coincidence because your prayers are going to be answered. That it isn't to say that there won't be great tribulations and troubles and, and um, that God will let the unbelieving depart so that you can be peace and not have peace and not be unequally yoked. He lets them depart, but he can save them down the road, can he not? Praise be to God. Uh, look at chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, excuse me. And uh, let's see. This is the um, Peter rehearsing the story about Cornelius and his household. And he's re rehearsing it before uh, the apostles because they were objecting that uh, Peter as a Jew went into the Gentiles' household and uh, ate with them and shared the word with them. But uh, Peter was basically sharing his revelation of how that uh, God let a sheet down out of heaven with all the unclean animals on it and told uh, Peter to rise and, and eat. And Peter said, no, nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth, Lord. And he said, what God has made clean, don't you make common or unclean, you know, basically. So he got he shared this revelation with the apostles. They were being they were kind of awed that God would even offer his salvation to the Gentiles. And so Peter was having to explain himself before them here, you know. And uh, <clears throat> let me read on let me see. Uh, and so uh, Cornelius in verse eleven says, And behold, forthwith three men stood before the house in which we were having been sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me to go with them, making no distinction. In other words, whether they were Gentiles or whether they were Jew, made no distinction. And these six brethren also accompanied me, and we entered into um, the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and fetch Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall speak unto thee words whereby thou shalt be saved, thou and all thy house. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, even as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then God gave unto them the like gift as he did unto us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And who was I that I should withstand God? In other words, he baptized them in the Holy Spirit and gave them the gifts of the Spirit. And who was he to say, God can't do that? And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also hath God granted repentance unto life. Well, the key word, of course, is in verse 14. Who shall speak unto thee words whereby thou shalt be saved, thou and all thy house. Once again, he's spoken this. If this was just a particular instance and not more broad, I would think we wouldn't see this as often in the Scriptures. You know, I don't think that that's the truth at all. Another one, Acts 2 and 39, I think is significant. I'll read verse 38. And Peter said unto them, Repent ye, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ unto the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For to you is the promise, and to your children. And as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him as many and as far off as the Lord our God shall call unto him. Well, that, of course, means us, and obviously it means us and our children too, right? Um, we have a right, according to the Scriptures, to believe in the blessing of our children. You know, God promised to us, by the way, 
in, uh, in Deuteronomy 28. Let me read that to you. <clears throat> uh, the blessing of our children. Uh, it's not to every Christian, if we lose the, use the, worm, loose, the term loosely, um, but it is to those who are truly disciples of the Lord. You know, Deuteronomy 28 and 1 says, And it came to pass, it shall come to pass, uh, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all of His commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Well, you know, <clears throat> keeping all of God's commands seems like a pretty heavy burden, and uh, obviously the disciples made the comment that, um, that they nor their fathers were able to do that. So God brought us under the grace dispensation in which uh, our sins are forgiven and the curse has been borne by our Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 3, uh, 13 through 16. And so um, we have a better, better covenant based on better promises. But yet this is the same, this is still the truth. If you hearken unto God's word, he will what? He will bless you in all these things. And verse 4 says, Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and uh, the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy beasts, and the increase of thy cattle, and the young of thy flock. That's a promise from God, that your seed will be blessed. Okay? If you hearken unto God's word, your seed will be blessed. You know, when God in, in 1 Corinthians 7 was speaking about the believer, uh, he's talking about somebody that believes the Word of God. He's not talking about an apostate. He's not talking about somebody that's just worshiping an idol, of, an idol of religion. He's talking about a disciple. A disciple has a right for their children to grow up to know the Lord. You know, raise them up in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. Well, what about when I came to the Lord and I didn't raise them up that way? You still have a right, and we just read it in these different texts here. Uh, these people were had all led a rebellious life against the Lord, and, and when they were called, their family had a right to come to. And so, <clears throat> but we also see in verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all of his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be the basket, shall be thy basket, and thy kneading trough. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the increase of thy cattle, and the young of thy flock. Cursed shalt be the fruit of thy body. You may say, well, David, um, you know, if I walk by sight, I would say that I must not have been obedient because my all of my children don't obey God. No, not necessarily so. Uh, you have to hold fast the confession of your hope that it waver not. You have to not walk by sight for your children. You have to see them in the light of the promises of the Scriptures. You know, the Lord um, bore the curse for us. And that means, of course, that we have a right not to, to, um, to go into bondage. I'm going to read that to you too. Galatians 3 and 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. That curse I just read to you. That your uh, uh, seed would not be blessed. Your seed would be cursed. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree that upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Oh, praise be to God. So Jesus, our Passover lamb, bore the curse for us so that we could have Abraham's blessings. Again, <clears throat> this does not include willful disobedience, walking in willful rebellion before God. We end up partaking of a penalty when we do that. You know, Hebrews 10.26 says, If we sin willfully after we receive a knowledge of the truth, 
there remains no sacrifice for sin but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. What could that judgment be? Well, it could be if you walk in willful rebellion that you'll lose your children, you'll lose your wife, you'll lose whatever. It could be that. David was a good instance of that, you know, I think as a type and a shadow. You know, when he sinned with Bathsheba, the prophet Nathan uh, rebuked him for it and, um, and told him basically that the penalty, because it was a willful disobedience, that the penalty would be that the sword would not depart from his house. And, of course, the son that was born to Bathsheba died. I think that's a type and a shadow there, you know. We don't want to rebel against God. It, you know, if you have, He will forgive you. Repent. Turn to Him. Lead a life of discipleship. Turn back to Him. And, um, and God's, you know, you don't have any faith if you're not serving God. You know, if our heart condemns us not, we have boldness towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we do the things that are pleasing in His sight. We keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. So it's in, some people say it's not possible for a person to do that. Well, well, you just don't believe the gospel if you don't believe that. I mean, God's made opportunity for us to be holy. And He made that opportunity through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He became accursed for us. He became sin for us. God took our sin and put it upon Him. We don't have to serve sin any longer. And we can serve God. I mean, that's the gospel. That's the good news. And back in Deuteronomy 28, let me read to you another verse here. It says, this is still under the list of the curses. It says in verse 32, Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day. And there shall be naught in the power of thy hand. In other words, you won't be able to do a thing about it. Um, and that's a part of the curse. In verse 41, Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be thine, for they shall go into captivity. Another part of the curse, listed under the curse. For those who do not obey, do not hearken unto the voice of the Lord. You see, um, <laughs> we it's most important, folks, that we don't trust in religion and we don't trust in men, but that we serve the Lord God. We have a personal relationship with the Lord, as they like to say in church often, a personal relationship with the Lord, a personal Savior. Well, you, in order to have a personal relationship with the Lord, it's between you and Him and this Word, uh, trans, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't, it doesn't matter if your church don't go there. You have to hearken unto this Word. Am I trying to put you under a, a, a legalism trip, you know, that you have to obey everything in order to? No. No, we, we, we have a sacrifice. If we fail, we can repent. But if you continue on in willful disobedience, God is saying that you're headed for a certain fearful expectation of judgment. And uh, basically, Jesus bore the curse for those who are ignorant, for those who have failed, for those who haven't found the power of God, but He won't bear the curse of a person who is walking in willful, stubborn rebellion. And part of the curse is that their children will be taken into captivity. To who? Well, the enemy. Who's the enemy? Well, the devil and the demons and the world and whatever, you know. They'll be in bondage. So, um, we, we need to fear God, right? We need to fear the Lord God. Um, something else I'd like to point out to you. Mark 11 and 24. You know, uh, when the Lord says... All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believe you received them. The word there is past tense. In all the ancient manuscripts, even the received text, it uses the word received, past tense. Believe you received them, and you shall have them. What does it mean to believe we've received the salvation of our loved ones? 
Well, once again, when you believe you've received a healing, you confess that healing, you uh, claim it as yours, you don't speak against it, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And uh, so you don't speak against it, you agree with it. If you do speak against it, you repent, you confess that to God as unbelief, and uh, you turn back to God in your faith for your children, your loved one, your wife, your husband, your grandparents, whoever you're believing God for, you know, whoever you're believing Him to save. Uh, you must, just like you receive everything else by faith, God uses your faith to bring things to pass. People say that uh, faith changes things. Well, that is true, but it's really starting on the wrong end of the stick, so-called. You know, God uses faith to bring to pass what He wants to do in the first place. See? Changing? Yeah. From our point of view, yes. But from God's point of view, it's simply us giving God the faith, which is the substance of the thing hoped for, so that God uses that to bring to pass what He wants to do to begin with, you see. And He wants to save our children. He wants us in the kingdom to have the joy of having them there with us. You know, heaven is, is just that. It's, it's heaven. It's a great place. And God wants it to be a great place for all of His people who have served Him. But also, there is a penalty to be paid for uh, rebelling against the Lord, being in stubborn rebellion, and rebelling against His Word. You know, we are, to, uh, we are to see our children in the light of Mark 11 and 24, when we believe we have received. He said, everything you pray for, all things whatsoever that you pray for, believe that you received them and you shall have them. That's the condition. Believe that you received them, and you shall have them. Do you doubt the, the power of the Lord to save your loved one? Do you doubt at all that He's going to do exactly what you've prayed for? Remember now, He said, everything you pray for, all things whatsoever, believe you received them, and you shall have them. That's God's command. Uh, your reasoning is, is not going to trump God's command. You know, so, so God wants us to hold fast that confession of our hope that it waver not. What does He say about the double-minded person that's unstable in all their ways? He says, think not that that man shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man unstable in all his ways, right? So, so we don't want to be double-minded about this, and we don't want to be dragged down by what we see. You know, it's not unusual for people to be sinners before they're saints. And it, it's really a part of uh, salvation is that God only saves sinners. So don't think it's unusual that you're praying for your loved one and they look like a sinner. They've got to be a sinner before they can be a saint. That's part of it, you know. In fact, sinners are the people that make saints. I mean, uh, <clears throat> to whom much is forgiven uh, loves much, Jesus taught. And so uh, if we're sinners... And God, by grace, picks us up. We really, really appreciate Him for this, you see. That's part of it. Don't be worried that your loved one that you're praying for looks like a sinner and acts like a sinner, talks like a sinner, and does really evil things. Don't worry about that at all. You're to walk by sight, not by faith. You're to accept the gift that God gives you. Everybody that God grants repentance to is a sinner. And uh, so, can God save any of them? He can save the worst. In fact, according to Him, the worst even make better saints. So don't worry about that. Don't say this person is too far beyond God's ability. It's, there's no such thing. You know, God has picked out some of the worst in the Scriptures in order to prove that, you know. The Apostle Paul, I think, kind of held himself forth as one of them, you know. One who was <clears throat> killing the saints, you know, basically. And uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees and killing the saints. You know, he was one of those bad people that... God decided he was going to save. And who prayed for him? Well, we don't know, but somebody somebody did, didn't they? Yeah. I want to point out to you 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and um, starting verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that one died for all, therefore all died. So, 
you know, we reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin, but do we reckon this person that we've prayed for to be dead unto sin? That's what we're commanded to do, right? Um, is, it, is it not just as right for us to have faith for others as it is to have faith for ourselves? You know, of course. And uh, faith is the substance of the thing hoped for, uh, while the evidence is not seen. So if you're not seeing the evidence, that's when you need faith, right? Um, faith is just a means to an end. Faith is that substance. It stands in as that substance until you see the answer. And yet the answer is made from the faith that you had. God uses the faith that you had to bring it to pass. So right here we're saying that we're seeing that, of course, that the Lord is saying that Jesus died um, for all, therefore all died. Right? We reckon them to be dead. And he died for all that they that live should no longer live unto themselves, but unto him who for their sakes died and rose again. In other words, he died for us to die and to resurrect, to have his life, right? So we don't live unto ourselves. The old man's dead. You see, we reckon him to be dead. We live unto God. Reckon yourself to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God, right? We are now alive unto God. <clears throat> Can you believe the same thing for your children? Because God will use your faith. Remember what, what faith is. It calls the things that be not as though they were. Faith is what God taught us in Isaiah, who sees the end from the beginning. See, we have to, like God, as sons of God, see the end from the beginning. Do you see this person as saved? If you've asked God to save them, do you see them as saved? Are you constantly speaking against your blessing? Are you hearkening unto the voice of the Lord? Or are you hearkening unto the voice of the carnal man who only walks by sight and by physical hearing? You know, Are you judging in the flesh? Or are you judging according to the Spirit? Use your faith. Hold fast to your faith. Don't be double-minded because you're not going to receive if you do, you see. You say, well, David, I've been very double-minded. Well, that's okay. Go to God, confess it as sin, forsake it, turn to God by faith, pray the prayers of faith, believe the prayers that you pray, all right? Verse 16, Wherefore, we henceforth know no man after the flesh. That's what we're talking about. We don't know these people uh, after the flesh according to what we've seen and what we've heard of them and what we know of them. We, we know them according to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and according to our faith, right? We henceforth know no man after the flesh, even though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now we know him so no more. And uh, those that we believe to be in Christ, the same situation. We don't know them so anymore, right? Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, ha have you got someone who has actually come to the Lord, but they're living in the world? Have you got someone who is caught up in false apostate religion that you think may not be saved because of that? Well, he says here, Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, the old are passed away. Things actually wasn't in the original. The old are passed away. Behold, they are become new. So, we are to see them according to our faith. We are to see them according to our prayers that we have prayed before God for them. And according to, of course, the, the precedent that we've seen in the Scripture today about household salvation. And, of course, I, I, I'm talking about household salvation, but it's true of other loved ones around you that may be not a part of your household, that you're praying and believing for them. It's not an accident. Nothing is an accident in this world. God works all things after the counsel of his own will. There is no such thing as an accident. Um, the fact that this person is in your heart and you love them and you want to see them saved, that's not an accident. God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So therefore, you're believing for this person because you love them and God put it in your heart to love them. So go ahead and love them and walk by faith for them and believe by faith for them and be steadfast for them. 
Okay? The old things are passed away. They've all become new. Don't worry that they, they're a carnal Christian and it doesn't look like they're bearing fruit and they may not make it and all these things that come into your mind. You know, the devil wars with our mind about our loved ones just as much as he does for a healing or a deliverance or any other thing that we have to walk by faith to see it in the end, right? <clears throat> he that endureth to the end shall be saved, right? Jesus said. But all things are of God who reconciled us unto himself through Christ. Reconciled meaning exchanged us. We, we're, we no longer live. Christ lives in us. We, he made that exchange, right? And, um, and he gave unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, how, how is our ministry of reconciliation? How are we to bring our loved ones to the Lord? You know, He said, to wit, that God was in Christ, in other words, here's our demonstration. Jesus was our demonstration. Uh, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world. He, he's not talking about Christians here. He's talking about the very least of mankind here. Reconciling the world unto himself. And how did he do that? Well, by not reckoning unto them their trespasses. Not reckoning unto them. You know, there are people that we consider unworthy. Isn't that right? Have you felt that? They're just unworthy. Yes, and it's in a, in a natural way, it's true. But he says here that you don't reckon unto them their trespasses. You're giving them a free gift from God here. You are the one who God sends as a minister of reconciliation, one who administers God's reconciliation, God's exchange of Christ's life into that life while that carnal life is nailed to the cross. It's through your ministry that this will come to pass in this person, you see. Um, not reckoning unto them their trespasses, having committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He's given this into our authority, the word of reconciliation. We are to offer them the really good news. You know, we pray for them. We believe for them. We offer to them the really good news of what Jesus accomplished at the cross, right? And we don't reckon unto them their trespasses. Yep, they might be a miserable failure, but what they need is faith to come to God, right? And when we don't reckon unto them their trespasses, and we point out to them the good news that, look what Jesus did. He took your sins away. He took the very nature of sin that's causing you to live like you are. He nailed it on the cross, and he gave to you the life of Jesus Christ. All he wants you to do is accept this free gift today. And I'm offering you this free gift today. So you're offering them the good news of the gospel that Jesus has already done this for them. And uh, <clears throat> you say, well, they're, they're too sinful, David, to even want it. Well, that's true, but that's where God comes in and your faith comes in. I mean, they're not going to come unless they're drawn. You know, dirt's dirt. You know, God's got the seed, but they're the dirt, frankly. Dirt doesn't really desire much of God. It has to be a gift. You know, it has to be a drawing from without. And, and God does this for them because of your faith for them. So when they get to the place where they're ready to listen to the gospel and God will bring them to that place, then you're able to minister to them reconciliation. Okay? And verse 20 says, We are ambassadors, therefore, on behalf of Christ. In other words, we have a God's authority to go to the world. See, we are ambassadors on behalf of Christ. As though God were entreating by us, we beseech you on behalf of Christ, be ye reconciled to God. Amen. Him who, he, who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf. So Jesus became us on the cross, and we became him. We don't live anymore. Christ lives in us, right? Him who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's an awesome gift, folks, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know, praise be to God, folks. Now we call the things that be not as though they were. Now we hold fast to the gospel and it comes to pass in our life. And we just offer this gift to someone else. They, they think that sounds too good to be true. But you see, God's able to put faith in their hearts, right? Praise be to God. And another verse I love, 
uh, Philippians 1, uh, 6 and 7. He says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it unto the day of Jesus Christ. God is able to bring to perfection that which he has committed unto you. Don't, um, don't give in to the condemnation of the world. Don't give in to the failure of your flesh. Walk by faith and not by sight. For yourself, for your loved ones, walk by faith because God is able to finish what he starts. Okay. Uh, verse 7, Even as it is right for me to be thus minded on behalf of you because I have you in my heart. It's right for us to be thus minded. The God who began the good work will finish it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He will finish it in you. He will finish it in your loved ones. Just trust God. Don't be. The devil wants to rob us uh, by getting our eyes on the problem, on their failure, on their inability to come to God. It's true. Everybody has inability to come to God. I mean, if, if Jesus doesn't draw us, we go right back under that rock we came, crawled out from under, folks, right back where we came from, you know. Um, it's not us. It's God. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. It's true for them. They can't come to God. He has to draw them. Uh, as Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Now, why does God choose our loved ones? Because he wants, he, they're sanctified because we are believers. God sets them apart. He gives them special treatment because we are believers. Thank be to God. Isn't that great? Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for drawing our loved ones and bringing them into the kingdom, Lord. We trust you with them in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, folks. For more information and materials, go to www.unleavenedbreadministries.org.